Hey, you're listening to the weekly sermon podcast, The Tab Talks, from the Lethbridge Christian Tabernacle. If you have any questions or if you'd like some more information on today's topic or about who we are, you're welcome to visit our website at thetab.ca. Thanks for tuning in. Grace and peace to you. started a series last week, and uh, it was a challenging series, I think. I think it's going to be a challenging series for some people here. Uh, I, I had a few people mention last week that, hmm, I'm not sure what to do with this, because the series that we started is called Ears to Hear, and, and last week we challenged that, that, that God, he's always speaking, that, that he's always speaking, and not just to us, that, that I actually believe that he's probably speaking to everybody. <laughs> and I mean everybody. I think he's always speaking probably to every person on the planet. We just probably don't know it. Certainly people outside the church, they probably don't know his voice. But that's part of the story in this season for us is that, that as we start this series, the, the first half of the series is for us. It's for us. How do we get, get better, clearer at hearing the voice of God, knowing his word, knowing the things that he wants to say to us. But the second part of it is, is our relationship with other people. One, how do we get better at, at hearing others around us? Like really listening to people. And even, even really listening to the world around us. It's easy to hear the, the junk, hear the darkness, hear the, the messy things. But, but how do we get really good at hearing, hearing the heart behind that? And I think the last part is, is how do we get really good helping to translate God to the world. That the people around us, just like Pam mentioned, God wants to speak into their lives. And he wants to use us to do it often. So that's the series. That's the journey that we've started on. And last week, the the challenge was pretty simple. It was just lean in. The challenge was simply, what does it look like to create space in your life to try to tune out the things that would want to deafen the voice of God. And I'm going to be honest, I don't know how everybody else's week was. I challenge you, you know, make space, try to lean in and try to hear what God said. I actually, the first part of this week, I don't know what it was, if it was just because it was, I was focused more on it. Everything just seemed exponentially louder in my life. I was busy this week, had so many things going on. The first part of the week, it seemed like there was just, I was bombarded with things constantly that at the moments when I'd want to sit down to listen, there'd be something that would come up and, or even just, you know, struggles with myself. So I ended up having to delete a bunch of apps, including Facebook from my phone and a bunch of other things in the middle of the week, just because it was too noisy and I couldn't hear. And so I stopped and, and partway through the week, it was just like there was this, this space of calm that finally hit a moment and I could hear some things. And I'm curious how everybody else's week, how did it go with, with the hearing? I, I gave you another challenge and a resource. Uh, and if you didn't get one last week, they're over there. There's a few left. Uh, it's a listening journal full of absolutely nothing right now. But the goal and the challenge was for you and I to try to write down anything that we think God might have said. So again, understanding that we might not know. We might be saying, that might have been God. I don't know. Maybe it was. Maybe it wasn't. But write it down anyways. That was the challenge. That was the assignment. Did anybody, anybody take me up on my challenge this week? Nice. A few people did. Excellent. Anybody here find this extremely easy? God was speaking like crazy, and you like it was just so easy, so much fun. Anybody? I, I knew Barb would be the one for sure. Everybody knew that. <laughs> That's awesome. Thank you, Barb. We're so blessed to have you here. Anybody find this extremely challenging? Anybody? Honestly? Yeah. Anybody find this impossible? Yeah. Okay. That's good. Excellent. This is where we get to start from. And I did it intentionally last week on a pretty vague basis. I I just said, you know, listen, what might you hear? I talked about, we're going to talk about kind of different ways that God can speak. On the back of this, we'd listed a bunch of 
some of the ways that he speaks. We talked about scripture, or we will today talk about scripture, desire, doors, dreams, people, prompting, and pain. Some of the, the ways that he uses it. Again, if you're interested, uh, those and the first part of this series comes directly from a, a book by a guy named Mark Batterson, who pastors a church in the States, and the book is called Whisper. And if you want to dive deeper into this, I, I would encourage you. There's tons, so many great books out there on hearing God's voice. Uh, this is one that I found that was, it's, it's pretty simple, and it's pretty basic, and it gets you into the, the initial part of understanding it. But if you've got a Bible, I'm going to invite you, I'm going to invite you, if you would, to turn to the book of John. John chapter 1. Let's see if this thing's working. It is, but it's not. Can you clear the background on that? Top left corner says clear background. Perfect. All right, John chapter 1. John chapter 1 says this. It says, in the beginning, the Word already existed. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. He existed in the beginning with God. God created everything through Him. And nothing was created except through Him. The Word gave life to everything that was created, and His life brought light to everyone. That's kind of what we talked about already, right? The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness can never extinguish it. But God sent a man, John the Baptist, to tell about the light so that everyone might believe because of his testimony. John himself was not the light. He was simply a witness to tell about the light. The one who is the true light, who gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. And he came into the very world he created but the world didn't recognize him. He came to his own people, and even even they rejected him. But to all who believed him and accepted him, he gave the right to become children of God. They were born not with physical birth resulting from human passions or plans, but, but a birth that comes from God. So the word became human and made his home among us. He was was full of unfailing love and faithfulness. And we've seen his glory, the glory of the Father's one and only Son. Genesis 1, we know well, but it says this. It says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty. It was void. Darkness was over the surface of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. And God said. Let's bow our heads one more time. Lord, this morning we gather, we sit at your feet, desiring, Lord, that you would speak into us, that you would shape us by your word. We thank you for the gift of your word, both the the written down portions that we get to dive deep into, but, but how you take those and you illuminate them and you bring them into something much bigger and more powerful that actually changes us and shapes us. So we ask this morning, by your word, would you shape us today? Spirit of God, have your way in this moment. Give us ears to hear what your spirit wants to say to us as your church today. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing to you, Lord. You are my strength. Amen. All right. On December 26, 2004, the largest earthquake ever recorded erupted 19 miles beneath the Indian Ocean. It was incredible. It reached a 9.1 on the Richter scale. It generated the equivalent of 23,000 atomic bombs, and the shock waves produced tsunami waves that measured over 100 feet and traveled at 500 miles an hour, reaching a radius of about 3,000 miles. That earthquake deep in the ocean tragically claimed the lives of 227,000 people. 
But there was a group of people living right in the path of the tsunami who somehow survived without losing even one person. These people were called the Moken. They are an Austronesian uh, ethnic group. They lived their lives on the open sea literally from birth. They have these boats that are called cabangs, and, and those boats are not just boats for transportation. That's actually their homes. They live in these boats. Their children learn to swim before they learn to walk. They see twice as well underwater as most humans do. And as you can imagine, they have this intimacy with the ocean. They read ocean waves the way that you and I would read a book. And on that day, the day that the Indian Ocean earthquake hit, an amateur photographer was uh, from Bangkok was taking pictures of this people group. And there was a moment just as the sea began to recede out. It, it had just moved just a little bit. And he photographed these people as they began to cry and they began to, to mourn and grieve because they knew it was about to happen. They began to explain to him that, that the birds had stopped chirping. They recognized, you know, elephants were heading for higher ground. Dolphins were swimming farther out to sea. And the Moken, who were near uh, the coast of Thailand, beached their boats, and they hiked to the highest elevation possible. And those who were out at sea went out deeper into the sea so that so they would know that, that, that tsunami would probably have less effect on them as they were farther out. The Moken survived, not because they... They knew how to look because they knew how to listen. They knew a language that others didn't know. As we talked about last week, six times in the gospel, and eight times in Revelation, Jesus says these words. He says, he who has ears to hear, let him hear what the Spirit is saying. I think this is probably one of the most critical moments in history. That's probably biased because I'm alive in this time. But, but I think that this is a critical moment as we are at the, a moment where we see the church, as we've talked about recently, kind of pushed to the sidelines, having less, you know, active role in the story of shaping culture than probably we would like. We see incredible destruction all around the planet, both on the, the environmental side but also on the human side. Yet, in the midst of that, there's so many beautiful things that, that, that you can look around and you see the beauty of creation and love. And, and in the midst of all of it, there is still so much good. But, but if there was ever a time for us to have ears to hear, it's now. Sometimes God shouts, and sometimes he whispers. I think every one of us hears a little bit differently. Literally, I think in some ways you could argue that, that God has billions of languages that he speaks, one for every single person on this planet. That every one of us has the ability to tune in to hear our creator speak to us. You could say that, that certainly you would say from taking in information, if we were just talking about our human beings and, and how we gather hearing information, what we're describing isn't just hearing it's taking in stuff, right? So we just, we're talking about hearing, but, but it's how we take in information. And our body has what we call five senses or five gates that naturally take in sound and, and taste and smell and our vision. And, and, and all of it together creates how we gather information. And every one of us, you know, we have greater strengths in certain areas and how we can hear. Just like when we talk about love languages, which I talk about frequently. I work with a lot of married or couples getting married and, and understanding that every one of us has a different way of understanding and interpreting love. That there's some that have you know, physical touch, words of affirmation, acts of service, quality time, gifts. Again, these are all reminding us that there are different ways that we hear and we connect with love. On top of that, the, the filters that we take in information through are, you know, our own personal history, our own personalities also affect how we receive and, and connect with information. And certainly the things we've been taught and theology also shape how information comes into us. They would even say that, that men and women have slightly different ears. We hear a little differently. Or men, sometimes not at all. True true. But all of this reminds us that, that a God that created every one of us knows how complicated, how complex, how unique we are. 
Through scripture, we read, though, over and over, he spoke to people. Over and over. If there's a common thread, it's that, that he speaks to people. The other part, though, is that there is no set formula in how he does it. Right? Sometimes it was through burning bushes. Sometimes it was through donkeys. Sometimes it was through you know, the whisper. Sometimes it was through a prophet. There were so many different ways that God speaks. And understanding that, that his diversity and how he speaks is all about his desire to make sure that he has our attention. Because what he says is kind of important. The very beginning in the beginning, God created. And in simply four words, he shaped everything. Let there be light. And he launched this whole creative process into motion with four words that in some ways some would, scientists would say are still actually creating at the farther edges of our universe, that those same four words are still creating today. Now, what would happen if you and I can cling just to four words or even just one word that he might want to speak into us? You see, there's tremendous creative power in God's word, that his word has the ability to reshape our thinking. It has the ability to to transform how we see ourselves and others. It has a uh, transformative power to, to shape entire worlds and cultures around us. There are seven ways that we're going to talk about out of that book that that God can speak. Certainly, this is not an exhaustive thing. Again, we've said he'll speak in many ways. But looking at Scripture, these seven ways, I want to challenge you as we're going to talk about, we're going to keep going with those journals. We're going to keep leaning in to listen and, and understanding that he might speak to you slightly different than he does to others. For some of us, it's about learning the most, the way that we most naturally hear God's word. So, Scripture is the foundation of everything. It's called the Word of God for a reason. And, and we're going to spend a few moments talking about that first. But let's talk about the other ones first. So the six things that we had... Bingo. Six other ways that he can speak often. We'll talk about desires. And this is, a, this is a, probably a confusing one. Uh, we're talking about how, how he may want to communicate, especially in the story of, of helping us to guide us. His word is a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. So, so what ways may he speak into us? And when we talk about desires, the language of desire shows up. You can see in Psalm 37, 4, it says, Delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. Uh, the, the word give in Hebrew, it literally means to conceive, that he will conceive a desire inside of you. In other words, he wants to birth a new kind of desire in you. I think some of us are afraid when we hear that word desire that that's the sinful nature will be what drives us. And we're worried that, that when we talk about desires, that, that we're worried that somehow sin will shape us and shift us and move us forward. But, but as we read here in Psalms and as we read throughout Scripture, this is what the Spirit does in us. This is what we would call a part of sanctification, that God transforms our desires. He shapes our desires. I could say lots more about that one. We'll skip that, though. Second one we'll talk about is dreams. Acts 2 says this. It says, I will pour my spirit out on all people. Your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. And old men dream dreams when God fills you with his spirit. This is about us and now. And I know there are different kinds of dreams. There are the pizza dreams. And then there's the the dreams that actually mean something. (laughs) Discerning between the two is a challenge sometimes, right? It's trying to figure out what does this mean? Does it mean anything? And and for many of us, I'm one of those people that most of the time I don't remember my dreams. Anybody like that too? Most of the time you don't? If I do, it usually does mean something. (laughs) And often, you know, in certain seasons where I find that, that dreams do become more significant, I find I'll actually, you know, put my journal right beside my bed and I'll pray a simple prayer. Lord, if you want to show me something tonight in my dreams, Lord, I'll, I'll make sure I try to get up and record it right away. 
dreams can be a powerful way. We can, you can look through so many scriptures, whether it's, you know, Daniel to others in the Bible where God has used dreams as a way to communicate to us. It helps get past sometimes some of our, our barriers that we have. The challenge certainly can be interpreting those dreams. Even in scripture, we see that as a challenge of how do you interpret what that means. And again, that's, as we were reading there, that last part where he says, this is, this is by the spirit that we understand this stuff. With all of these, again, when we're talking about hearing God's voice, the challenge I'm going to put out to you is is, is use the Scripture, use the the Word of God as as a way of trying to filter through to interpret and understand what God might be saying in the dream. But also use others, people that you trust. Bring them into the story. And that could be for any of the words that you hear that, Lord, I'm not sure on this. Lord, would you confirm this with another person or two that would help me understand that this is what you are saying? can be a powerful thing. When it comes to dreams, I find one of the most confusing things right now is that the internet is so complicated. You can go on there and type in, hey, I had a dream about this, and you get like a billion different things from sources that I a little sketchy sometimes, And but it can be an amazing resource as well, and we can actually have some great sites I can direct you to, but, but again, just dreams can be a powerful way to God, for God to speak to us. Doors. It's another way. A prayer that I've prayed often comes out of Revelation 3, 7, 8. It says, it says, he opens what no one can shut, and he shuts what no one can open. See, I have placed before you an open door. Often doors is a way that he can speak, right? It's, it's literally him telling us, no, don't go, or yes, go. So it's almost the simplest way of him speaking to us. Red light, green light, right? It's, it's him letting us know how to, how to move forward in situations, and certainly doors are an important thing. And, and I know some people are always afraid to pray that, Lord, shut this door or open this door. But, but I, I'm certain that someday I'm going to look back when I'm older and say, Lord, thank you for all of those doors that you shut in front of me. You know, for me, that was one of the things I was, you know, I was, I was like ready to play professional football. And suddenly my knee's blown and that door is closed and I'm like in chaos. Lord, you don't love me. I prayed and asked you to open this door and you just did and then it slammed shut. But looking back now, I'm so grateful for what God did through that. And, and I think that's the story of, of us faithfully following him on the journey and trusting him as he opens and closes those doors. Uh, the last four are all P's. So people, certainly we know that God can speak through people. Scripture reminds us of this. Uh, God used the prophet Nathan to rebuke King David. Uh, he used uh, an uncle named Mordecai to speak into who would be a queen, Esther. There's so many different people along the way through Scripture, but certainly in my own journey who have spoken into my life that God has used to speak into me. And sometimes I think it's probably one of the most, most powerful things, but it's also something that we can lean a little too heavily on sometimes, I think. We, we, can, be, we can shut ourselves off to all the other ways that he speaks sometimes because we get, in our culture, so tuned to this. This guy, the talking head up here, who speaks, and certainly I'm here to do the best I can to, to share what God puts on my heart. But again, the, the challenge sometimes in our culture is that we can and make this everything and not necessarily sometimes run it against the word of God or, or make sure that it's the word for me in the season. So we're going to talk more next time we talk in a couple of weeks about, about people in our lives and, and the prophetic opportunities we have. But prompting would be the next one. Prompting is one that we'd say is, is, is God's voice that guides us behind us. Isaiah 30 verse 21 says this. Uh, verse yeah, sorry, 30 verse 21 says, whether you turn to the right or to the left, your ears will hear a voice behind you saying, this is the way, walk in it. I'm grateful for that voice. That voice that speaks in those moments that, that shapes me and guides me and, and moves me. And just as, as Pam was praying earlier, just you know, in the little moment, the slight prayer, and God you know, gives something, yeah, go. This is where you should go. Those, those little promptings that he issues into our lives. And these are all kind of opposed, uh, uh, connected to the bigger story in many ways he can list, speak to us. But the final one that we were going to talk about in this way is, uh, is pain. The language of pain is one that we don't really like. I don't know. 
It's kind of weird how that works. C.S. Lewis uh, said that God whispers to us in our pleasures, but he shouts in our pain. You can ignore the Bible if you really wanted to. You can leave it on the shelf. You can leave it on your bedside table, but it's really hard to ignore pain. You see, part of that, when we talk about pain, it's a byproduct of the curse, certainly. We know that, that someday pain will be gone. We will enjoy wholeness and a life with no pain. But, but in the meantime, it's probably good to listen to pain. It tells us sometimes if we're in the, doing the wrong thing. It tells us sometimes if maybe we're, we're approaching a situation the wrong way, if we haven't maybe t- carefully moved into a space. Pain is an amazing marriage counselor. <laughs> Pain is a life coach. Pain is a professor of theology. Pain teaches us some of the hardest lessons in our lives and some of the most important to learn. It's part of the natural thing as well, I think. When I I look at the consequences side of things, I, I have a very, very energetic little boy who loves to do crazy things. Were it not for pain, he would probably do some extremely crazy things. He has, and he's learned the hard way sometimes that, that there are consequences. And, and that's what pain can be for us sometimes, that God can use those in our lives to help guide us. Now, all of those out of the way. Those are, again, I'm just throwing out different ways as you're spending time listening in these next few weeks. As you're leaning in, ask yourself, maybe is God speaking to me in one of these ways? Is there something that he's wanting me to hear and understand in one of these things? But at the end of the day, the number one tool that we've been given is his word. It is an incredible gift. The the idea that that we read in in Timothy, it says that all scripture is God-breathed. It's it's like when when we open up the pages of this, God breathes and begins to speak. When I was 25 years old, I, uh, I had grown up in church my whole life. Like, my dad was a pastor. I, I probably sat through you know, thousands of sermons. I could quote you lots of scriptures. Couldn't tell you where they were. But because I'd sat through so many sermons and, and sang worship songs, you know, I knew a lot of scripture. And as hard as I had tried up to that point, I had never been able to get through the Bible. I had like, you know, I'd do everybody, you know, the the Genesis 1 thing and try to truck on through and plow through those, you know, numbers and Leviticus. And and, and every time, you know, I'd I'd get some momentum and I'd have some passion for it and then it would like fade. And the passion for it was more just the sense of I'm supposed to do this as a Christian, right? I'm supposed to know this stuff because this is what I believe. And, And up till that point... I just couldn't do it. I loved the Bible. Don't get me wrong. I, I opened the Psalms regularly, and I'd, you know, I'd love that as a musician. I'd love the poetic nature, and and even the tension as David would would write about. Man, oh God, this is horrible. But you're awesome. But this is really bad. I loved that stuff. I loved the honesty in that. But for the most part, I couldn't get through the Bible. And but something happened. I was I had a mentor in that season, and he. He was challenging me and a group of guys that we were working through, working with in that season to read through the Bible. And as soon as he said it, I'm like, oh, man, I knew he was going to say that. I just, oh, man, this is going to suck. And not that I, I mean, I loved God's word, but I would just, I knew in my own strength I probably wouldn't be able to do it. I actually, in, in university, had a couple friends as well who were uh, um, professors who had read through the Bible. I remember sitting in their classes and they're like, yep, it's a good book, nothing special. And it blew my mind how people could read through the whole thing and still, but there's something about that understanding, right? That the words on the paper and whatever translation you read, in some way are words on a paper. But when the Spirit of God comes into the space of us understanding, the words become alive and they begin to shape. And and, and this mentor of mine challenged me, and he said, here's what we're going to do. We're going to do this together. And so we started together in this space where we'd get together and we'd pray. We did it for about three weeks straight. I had, he challenged me and said, if you're going to do this, let's do it together. And we did it for three weeks, and we got together, and we opened the Word. But we, we did small chunks. 
So I'm like, at this pace, it's going to take me like a decade to get through this. But the small chunks that we opened, we would pray a simple prayer in the beginning. Lord, would you speak through this? Whatever, whatever you want to say through these words that we're going to read in this obscure portion of the Bible, would your spirit come in and open our ears to hear what you might want to say? There's a practice called Lectio Divina. I've never heard of, never heard of it. It's an ancient practice that was brought to the West from the Desert Fathers in uh, the 5th century or so. And the practice was quite simple. It was that you would take the word, you would read a small portion, and then you'd meditate on it. And you'd say, Lord, what do you want to say about this little passage? And then the third step, so you'd read it, you'd meditate on it, and then you'd pray it back. You'd say, Lord, this is what I think I got from it. This is, this is what I want to say to you in response to what you have said to me. I might be wrong, but this is what I heard. And then the fourth step is probably the most important step, is you allow that word that you just read to actively shape your life, to let it change your thinking, to, to give it room in your consciousness so that it could shape what you believe and shape maybe what you think about yourself or about God or about others. We did this for a few weeks this friend of mine. And the funny thing that happened is that, that God did something powerful in that season. I could get enough of the Bible. It started with these small little chunks, and then at the time I was still managing sport check, and, and so I'd be like sneaking into the bathroom because I didn't want to do it in my office because people would know that I wasn't working, and I'd go into the bathroom, and I'd, <laughs> I'd start reading a little scripture. And, and there was something that came so alive in the season as the word began to shape me. Growing up, my parents were huge Gaither fans. Anybody remember Gaithers, Gaither fans? Yeah. There was a song that had this line that said, I hear you're getting into the word, but is the word getting into you? Now, did that line from that song suddenly totally made sense? It's one thing for us to get into trying to read the word, but it's a whole other thing when we give space in our lives for the word to get into us, and to shape us, and to mold us. Because his word has tremendous creative power. The word is a filter. It's as you hear things in this next season, whether it's through you know, people around you, whether it's through situations, whether it's through you hearing a still small voice or whatever it is, whether it's through a movie, as I said, don't, don't write anything off. God could speak through anything. If it's a donkey that walks up to you and starts talking, then make sure. You filter that through the word still. Just make sure. Just make sure that it's actually God speaking to you. But, but I genuinely believe this, people, that God wants to speak to us. That every single one of us in this room, he is speaking to you. My prayer is still the same as it was last week. Lord, open our ears. Every one of us, whether it's through the word, whether it's through whatever, this week, I believe God is going to speak to you. And I pray that our ears be open to hear. Here's the challenge. I said we're going to do these weird things in our services for the next little while. I want us just to take a few moments here. And if you got a Bible, crack it open. See what God might lead you to. Maybe pray a little prayer. I'll pray in a second too. But I want you to take his word. And I want you to see what God might want to say to you. If you want to use an app, great. If you want an actual hard copy, I have a few here. And I think we have a few over there as well. If you needed a, if you wanted a good old paper copy to look at, just put your hand up and we'll make sure you get one if anybody would like one. Would you just take a few minutes right now and see what God might want to say to you in his word? Whatever that is, again, like I said last week, write it down in your journal if you think it's him speaking. Even if you don't have time to write the whole passage out right now, write down where it's found so you can come back to it and reference it. But let's, let's take a few moments right now. I know this is the weird things we do at the tab and just spend a few moments listening to what God might want to say through his word right now. Well, did anybody think that God spoke to you through his word? He gave you something in this moment. Yeah. Yeah. 
there is a very real possibility even that some of what you might have heard might not have just been for you. And I, I, I actually did what I don't normally do. I just flipped the Bible open to see where it would land. And here's what I read. It says, the people who have survived the sword will find favor in the desert. I will come to give rest. This is from Jeremiah 31. And verse 3 says, The Lord appeared to us in the past, saying, I have loved you with an everlasting love. I have drawn you with loving kindness, and I will build you up again, and you will be rebuilt. Again, you will take up your tambourines, and you're going to go out and dance with joy. Again, you will be planted in vineyards. And the farmers will plant their fruit and rejoice, and for a day is coming. And rejoicing will come. I think that's true for probably some of us here. I'm curious, though, anyone bold enough they want to share or, or think that you have a small portion of Scripture that you think that God might have said something either to you that you just want to share or to all of us. Anybody have anything that they want to share? Just a small portion? Anybody think they have anything? From Psalm 143, verse 8, he caused me to hear your loving kindness in the morning. For in you do I trust. Cause me to know the way in which I should walk. For I lift up my soul to you. And this week was rather overwhelming. In the last 10 days, actually, we had six funerals. Which do I go to? So I asked the Lord, I need your guidance. I was able to make four of them, but a blessing yesterday in Grassy Lake, one fellow we were praying for for 17 years, and we asked the Lord, send him a partner, and this blessing that we heard, and we met this girl, his girl, wonderful Christian couple, and so I just thank the Lord. Um, the places that I went, all funerals were different denominations, one God, many folds. This is Isaiah 60. Arise and shine, for the light has, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. For darkness, for behold, darkness shall cover the earth, and thick darkness the peoples. But the Lord will arise upon you, and his glory will be seen upon you. And nations shall come to your light, and the kings to the brightness of your rising. Seems to be a theme here. Philippians 4.13, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Man, that's a powerful one. Romans 1.13. Uh, no, hang on. Uh, Romans 1, 12. I want to bring you some spiritual gift to deepen your faith. And that will mean that I shall be encouraged by you, each of us cheered by the other's faith. Then I should like you to know, my brothers, that I have long intended to come to you, but something has always prevented me, for I should like to see some results among you as I have among other Gentiles. I think that's for the church. I, I, I believe that we as a church have long looked to the head of the church to be the talking head, as you call it. And I believe Christ is calling each one of us to let forth the gifts, and he wants that gift to come. And he, he's, something's prevented him all this time. Uh, in light of what you shared about uh, the tsunami, I uh, 
found myself in Revelations 20 when it spoke of the judgments and <clears throat> and I thought of the what sometimes really oppresses us is fear and then I got into chapter 21 then I saw a new heaven <laughs> and a new earth for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away and the sea no longer existed I also saw the holy city New Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God, prepared like a bride, adored for her husband. Then I heard a loud voice from the throne. Look, God's dwelling is with humanity, and he will live with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. Man. It's good. I work in the school system, and um, I've been finding it ooh, at times overwhelming with some of the things that are going on, and the day can feel pretty chaotic and busy, and I was thinking, you know, I hear people talk about what's going on in the world around us, and we can see lots of stuff that feels chaotic and challenging and hard to take, and um, one morning I was just crying out to the Lord and it's like, I don't know how to do this. I'm struggling, I'm floundering here. And um, I feel that he spoke to my heart and he said, your job is to love and enjoy people. I'll take care of the rest. That's good. I end up in uh, Jeremiah 49, and it's all about the message that uh, Jeremiah received from the Lord. And there's 10 of them in just one chapter, so, and he wrote them down. So that's me that he was listening to the Lord. It's good. It's good. The habit of writing down what you hear. This is from Luke chapter 12, and the heading is watchfulness. Be dressed, ready for service, and keep your lamps burning like men waiting for their master to return from a wedding banquet, so that when he comes and knocks, they can immediately open the door for him. It will be good for those servants whose master finds them watching when he comes. We could probably keep doing this all morning. There's some great stuff in here. <laughs> I, again, I want to challenge us this week. Uh, lean in. Make space for God to speak. For those of you who said you didn't hear him this week, I know you're going to hear him this week. He wants to speak. And it might be through his word. It might be through someone else. But he is here. The, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. Now, it'd be awesome if Jesus physically was standing right here. But he realized he could only reach so many in that form. So he said, it's better that I go. Way better that I leave so that I could leave, leave my spirit with you. So the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And he's still here desiring to speak. We thank you, Lord. We thank you for what you've done. We thank you for this morning, for what you've already accomplished, but we thank you for what you have in store for this week. So we give you praise. We give you all the glory. And we thank you for what you've done. Hey, you're listening to the weekly sermon podcast, The Tab Talks from the Lethbridge Christian Tabernacle. If you have any questions or if you'd like some more information on today's topic or about who we are, you're welcome to visit our website at thetab.ca. Thanks for tuning in. Grace and peace to you.